Let's have a word of prayer together. Dear God in heaven, may you anoint my lips with your spirit. May you anoint our ears with your spirit so we can hear the words for today. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're living in in dangerous times, very dangerous times. I imagine that you're wrestling with what's going on in our nation and world and projecting in your mind where things are heading. I know I'm doing this daily. Things don't look good for our country and the world, do they? The Oxford Dictionary recently named the word post-truth as 2016 International Word of the Year after its usage, usage skyrocketed during the Brexit referendum in England and the U.S. presidential race. The dictionary defines post-truth as relating to our denoting or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. In this case, the post-suffix doesn't mean after so much as it implies an atmosphere in which a notion of truth is irrelevant. Now, scholars at Oxford Dictionary are registering the fact that truth is becoming a rare commodity in the world, and everyone is talking about this fact. You know, anybody who follows the news can see this. I read an article this week about about how major corporations use secretive public policy institutes to flood the media with disinformation in order to influence people's viewpoints in the direction they want people to think. These organizations have so much influence over the public sphere because they have more money than anyone else. You know, money is corrupting every part of our society. It is corrupting the medical establishment. It's corrupting our schools and our banks. It's corrupting our courts, our corporations. It's corrupting our government. It's corrupting even sports. It's corrupting us. As a result, truth is suffering. It's being crucified before our eyes. Does anyone care? Is anybody worried? It should worry us greatly. Where will this all lead? When truth becomes irrelevant, then moral chaos and tyranny must follow. The prophet Isaiah reminds us of how dangerous our post-truth situation is. In Isaiah 59, verse 14 and 15, the prophet says these very pertinent words to our time. He says, justice is turned back and righteousness stands far away for truth has stumbled in the public squares, and uprightness cannot enter. Truth is lacking, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. The Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. When truth suffers in the public sphere, then justice suffers. The public sphere becomes a place where the righteous are victimized. When truth is rejected, then the righteous are considered criminals. So we're living in serious times. You have probably heard about the fires this week in Gatlingsburg, Tennessee, with at least 13 people dead. 85 people treated for burns and around 1,000 structures burned. The devastating fires destroyed property, took life. When embers from a forest fire 10 miles away in Smoky Mountain National Park were blown by winds of up to 90 miles an hour, and in 15 minutes, they reached the town. Now, the fires affected Dollywood, the estate of Dolly Parton. And Isaac McCord, who works for the Dollywood estate, was working that day, and he was part of the cleanup process. He says that he found a piece of paper in a puddle of water. The edges were burned black, but much of it was preserved. And when he picked it up, he discovered that it was a page from the Bible. Joel chapter 1. And uh, there were a few verses that were legible. Verse 15, for example, Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near, and as the destruction from the Almighty, it comes. Verse 19, To you, O Lord, I call, for fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and flames has burned all the trees of the field. Verse 20, Even the beasts of the field pant for you, because the water brooks are dried up, and fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness. Chapter 2, verse 1 was also something that he could read. Blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, it is near. 
So he read this verse and he burst out crying. Now, we weren't there when it happened, so the full emotional impact of reading these verses may be lost to us. But our knowledge of prophecy should give us enough perspective so that we too burst out crying with him. The end is near, very near indeed. Why is it so important to us to know that Jesus is coming soon? Why is it important for us to be constantly reminded again and again? What can we do about it? What should we do about it? You see, we must prepare ourselves and others to stand in the day of the Lord. This is really all that matters now. Being prepared, preparing others. All our attention should be focused on this preparation. Otherwise, we will not be ready. So how do we prepare? John the Baptist and Jesus were sent to prepare people for this great event. Their message was powerful and exciting. They both spoke in very simple language. They both said the same thing, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Notice how their messages were the same. The kingdom of heaven is near. Repent. If this was the message sent to Israel to prepare God's people for the second coming, then it's also the message for us today to prepare ourselves in the world for the soon coming of Jesus. We need to return to this message in its simplicity. It must become a way of life. Ellen White wrote that the way to heaven is the way of repentance and confession. Now, there's a lot we need to understand around these words in order to appreciate these very simple words. You see, God's message through John and Jesus was the only message at this time calling for people's attention in this way. In fact, there were others preaching and teaching. They were calling for people's attention. But they brought a very conf- a message that conflicted with what Jesus was saying. The contrast between Jesus and John and what the others were preaching couldn't be greater. Their message was unique. The people were faced with the decision. Which message presented the way of life? Which message would they accept? It must have been a confusing time for many. It must have been difficult. A lot was at stake. Eternal life. Now you see, through the centuries, Israel had lost their understanding of the right way. They were as far from the right way as the east is from the west. So God needed to place his people on the right spiritual ground if they were to be ready for the end. And this required a drastic change, a deep, deep change in their thinking, a foundational change. They had the source of truth, the Bible, but they didn't have the right understanding of the Bible because they lacked the true foundation for understanding it. Could it be that we also need a foundational change in our understanding of the Bible's message? You know what? I believe God is calling us back to the foundation that Jesus laid so that we can have a right experience with God and be prepared for the second coming. We need to build our house on this, the right foundation in order to be able to pass through the last days. So let us study the right foundation that John and Jesus were trying to lay in Israel together. Open your Bibles to Luke chapter 7, verse 29 and 30. Now these verses come before the passage that was read earlier. Luke chapter 7, verse 29 through 30. When all the people heard this, and the tax collectors too, they declared God just, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the purpose of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. So in this passage, we read that the Pharisees and the lawyers did not receive baptism, which was God's plan for them. They rejected the essence of John's and Jesus' message by not being baptized. You see, this baptism was a symbol of their message. John was not some wild fire-eyed prophet who brought the fear of God into people's eyes, lives. No, he was a prophet of grace. Jesus was not just some revolutionary teacher. No, he was a Messiah called to teach grace. Now, how did they do this? They taught baptism. You see, baptism was God's symbol of grace and of dependence upon grace. Both John and Jesus 
We're laying low human accomplishments by showing the people their sins and inviting them to receive God's grace by being baptized. And God's grace consists of two things. It consists of forgiveness and it consists of the Holy Spirit's power. By being baptized, the people acknowledge their helplessness, the impossibility of saving themselves. So God wanted the Israelites to have a new religious experience based on grace, not on human works. Man is not saved by works, but by grace. Now Jesus called this new experience the new birth. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now this was the right foundation to build on. This concept was new for the Jewish people at this time, but all the prophets before had taught this. The Jews had built their religious experience on human works and human accomplishments. The majority of the Pharisees were not prepared to receive this message because it went against their foundational beliefs. And they were too proud to acknowledge their mistakes and give them up. And so Luke writes, they rejected God's purpose. The Pharisees were committed to following another project, the project of self reformation, of self-improvement. They were the self-improvement gurus of the day. They sought to live a righteous life through obedience to the law. There was nothing wrong in obedience to God's law. In fact, obedience to the law is God's goal for us. No one can see God without holiness, purity, and righteousness. It was God who gave the Ten Commandments. And Jesus said that I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. So God's goal for us is righteousness and obedience to all the commandments of God. What was then wrong with their project? Well, their way of achieving righteousness was the wrong way. They relied on their own works and attainments instead of on the grace of God. So God had promised in the Old Testament to write the law in the hearts through grace, and they attempted to do this through their own effort. God had communicated to the prophet Jeremiah that he would do the work in their hearts. Jeremiah 31, 33 through 34. The prophet Jeremiah says this, I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, know the Lord for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. So did you catch it? How is God going to write his law in people's hearts? Through grace. All will know me, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. The thing that would distinguish God's people from the world was their experience of forgiveness and the Spirit. They would really know him in a deep, personal, private way through his immeasurable grace. The text says that God will not remember their sin anymore. This points to the way in which God's grace would cleanse them of their sin. Now, the Pharisees did not succeed in their project of self-improvement because they did not seek righteousness through faith in God's grace. Paul writes about their utter failure in Romans chapter 9, verse 30 and 31. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it, that is a righteousness that is by faith, but that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law? Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on, on works. The Pharisees failed because they pursued righteousness by works instead of faith. They refused to put their faith in the grace that Jesus offered them. But instead of all their efforts making them more righteous, they became more unrighteous. The exact opposite of what they were struggling for. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 15, Jesus describes them as children of hell and their disciples as more children of hell than them. You see, it went from bad 
to worse. Now, the book of Matthew is a good place to begin understanding the Pharisees. If you open with me to Matthew chapter 23, we will look at five characteristics of the Pharisee mentality or mindset. Now, verse 23, actually verse uh, 25, I mean, we are told, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup. This text tells us that they sought to be clean. They sought indeed to be righteous. But Jesus goes on to say that they did not achieve cleanliness because they managed to only clean the externals. He said, inside you are full of greed and self-indulgence. So here are the five characteristics of the Pharisees. The first characteristic is that they were hypocrites. At least four times he mentions their hypocritical nature. Verse 3, for example, he says to them that they preach, but they do not practice. So do and observe what they tell you, but not the works that they do, for they preach, but do not practice. So this is one characteristic of the hypocritical nature. One speaks, one admonishes, but one doesn't actually do it. Verse 25, we already talked about, they were full of greed and self-indulgence, and nobody could see it. Verse 27, he compares them to whitewashed tombs, which outwardly, outwardly are beautiful, but are full of dead people's bones. When you think about this, this is a very descriptive picture of what was in their hearts. They were killing people in their hearts by their evil condemnation of other people and criticisms. There were many bones in their lives, many dead people that they had slaughtered with their thoughts. So the first characteristic, they were hypocrites. The second characteristics, characteristic is that they majored in minors. In verse 23 and 30, um, 24, he talks about that. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. So they were sticklers for what was right. They were focused on the details of paying tithe for all the things that they, that they earned or that they gained. But they didn't practice justice with their neighbor. They were not merciful. So they were sticklers in the small things, but they didn't practice love. The third point, they were very demanding of other people. They actually often demanded more of other people than they demanded of themselves. Verse 4, they tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. So they expected a lot of other people. They had unfair expectations of their brothers and sisters. That is the third characteristic. The fourth characteristic, they were motivated by desire for honor and respect. They loved when people praised them and gave them attention. Verse 6, they loved the place of honor at the feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces being called rabbi by others. The last characteristic is that they persecuted God's prophets of grace. Verse 29 through 36, I won't read those passages, but they describe that they thought they would never persecute God's people, but they in fact went after them through criticism and through other means, they were persecuting people who were declaring grace, just like John the Baptist and Jesus. They said to themselves, we would never have done what the fathers did to the prophets. But their lack of humility condemned them. If they had only known their own hearts, they would never have said this. Now the spirit of Phariseeism is alive and well in our day, in our hearts. And that's why it's so important 
to study together the message of God's grace. We have all struggled with Phariseeism. And unless we know God's grace every day, we will fall back into it. It is one of the most pernicious and destructive forces of the Christian walk. The Christian life has high standards for us to follow. And the higher the moral standards we have, the greater the temptation to fall into Phariseeism. Phariseeism is a religion of criticism, fault-finding. The Pharisees were always trying to correct other people's behavior. They found lots of faults, even with Jesus. He didn't keep the Sabbath right. He spent time together with people that he shouldn't spend time with. He didn't wash his hands before eating. He didn't respect the traditions of the fathers. You see, they were the correctors. The Pharisees were the self-proclaimed moral police, the upholders of the traditions and the standards of the fathers. They were the protectors of orthodoxy, the ones who were always arguing against theological heresy and the danger of turning away from the truth, the ones who always knew how things should be done. They were impossible to live with because they judged you by how you dress, how you eat, and how you greet others. They went around like the burqa police do in Iran, harassing women who don't have their heads covered, who don't dress appropriately. The Pharisees put themselves as judges over everyone except themselves. They lived above everyone else. They saw their own perfection and the other people's mistakes. They had a holier-than-thou attitude. The Pharisees conveyed actually great concern and zeal for God's holiness. But unbeknownst to them, they had actually placed themselves even above God. They hoisted their own standard of righteousness up to the top. It was highly addictive to be in the judge's chair, to stand above everyone else as better. And it made them blind to their own spiritual bankruptcy. It made them hypocritical. It made them critical, harsh, and cruel. But you know, Jesus had compassion on the Pharisees. Thank God he has compassion on Pharisees like us today. Because if he didn't, we wouldn't be here. Much of what Jesus taught us was against Phariseeism. The whole Sermon on the Mount, for example, was an attempt to rescue the Pharisees from their own religious blindness. In the Beatitudes, for example, he establishes grace as the foundation for righteous living. Just look at the first two verses with me in Matthew chapter 5. Verse 3, for example, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is chapter 5, verse 3 and 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Righteous living starts with our recognition that we are spiritually bankrupt. It starts with us mourning over our spiritual bankruptcy. It starts with us receiving the kingdom of God as a gift. But you see, it doesn't stop there. It continues in like manner. Jesus didn't say, blessed are those who were once poor, or blessed are those who once mourned. No, blessed are those who are poor, those who do mourn. It is a continuous experience. The idea is that God's people will see their need and dependence upon God's grace forever. If we return to Luke chapter 7, we will see that Christ tried to save the Pharisees from their blindness. Even though they had rejected the baptism of John the Baptist, there was still hope that they would see the light. Now, if you go with me back to Luke chapter 7, verses 33 through 36, to what Jesus says in verse 30, uh, actually starting with verse 31, sorry. <clears throat> he starts here, he says, To what then shall I compare the people of this generation, and what are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not weep. For John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by all of her children. Chapter 2, verse 
I mean, sorry, the next verse. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. Okay, let's think about this for a second. So in Luke 7.36, Jesus is invited to a big feast at Simon the Pharisee's house. He went there for the same reason. He went to the tax collectors and sinners because he wanted to save Simon, like he wanted to save the tax collectors and the sinners. I imagine that there were many other Pharisees there sitting together with them. He wanted to save them as well. Now, what makes John, Luke chapter 7 so significant is that all the other Gospels place Simon's party at the end of Jesus' life, just before he was crucified. Whereas Luke places it relatively early in the Gospel. You might think that Luke was confused about the order of the events, or that he simply didn't care about the order of the events. But he was not confused, and he did care about the order of events. But he had another consideration. He wanted to show us something very important about Jesus that would not be made clear if he put this at the end of the story. The reason why he places this story here is because he wants us to see how Jesus tries to save the Pharisees. We have just read earlier in Luke chapter 7 about how Jesus criticized them for rejecting baptism and grace. Now, we will see how he tries to save them. The focus is not necessarily on Simon, because his name is not even mentioned in the story. Instead, the focus is on, the, on Phariseeism in general. Luke is trying to speak to us today. We who are struggling to live righteously at the end of Earth's history. So let's meditate upon this party, because this party tells us about his saving grace. There is a surprise visitor at the party that brought the revelers, the revelers to their senses. Mary Magdalene comes into the room and moves quietly to where Jesus was reclining on the floor at Jesus' feet. Here she falls down on her knees and weeps. Her tears roll down from her cheeks onto his feet. She wipes his feet with his hair, and then she kisses his feet over and over again. After which she pours out a perfume on his head first and on his feet. What a scene to behold. A weeping woman. Imagine people beginning to look her way, wanting to know where the smell was coming from. Some may have asked, who is this lady? Well, others already knew. She was known as a sinner. E.G. White tells us, Ellen G. White tells us that she struggled with sexual sin. Sin that her uncle, Simon, had led her into. But in Luke chapter 8, verse 2, we learn that Jesus had cast out evil spirits from her seven times. She was one who had struggled with sexual sin. There must have been a lot of questions and whisperings in the room about her. Why was she doing this? How could she? Because she was crossing the line of what was acceptable. How dare she touch the master in this way? The guests at the party seemed scandalized by what was taking place. Everybody felt uncomfortable. According to the other Gospels, Judas criticizes her publicly first for not giving the money from the perfume to the poor. The disciples criticize her as well. And we learn also that there are others who are criticizing her. Now, Luke is the only one who focuses on Simon, the Pharisee. He focuses exclusively on the Pharisee's criticism. Simon didn't say anything, but Jesus could read his thoughts. You see, Simon was scandalized by Jesus' response. Here she was, a sinner, an evil person. Didn't Jesus know it? He should have. Didn't he claim to be a prophet? He should never have allowed her to do this to him, he thought to himself. This was not a respectable thing to do. You see, Simon attacked both the moral character of Jesus and the moral character of Mary. It was an attack, actually. It was a very fierce attack in his heart and his mind. Now, on the outside, he maintained his composure like a good Pharisee would. But on the inside, he was angry and ashamed of her behavior. He was disappointed and perhaps even disgusted with Jesus. 
Now Jesus knew what was going on in his heart, and he addressed Simon's unloving thoughts. First, Jesus gets Simon's attention by saying that he would like to speak with him. Then he tells Simon the parable of a moneylender and two debtors who were both bankrupt. They were both unable to pay their debt. The one owed 50 denarii, the other owned 10 times more, 500 denarii. The money lenders canceled, the money lender canceled both of their debts without any demands. Jesus asked the question, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. Then Jesus turned to Mary and defended her. Jesus had come to Simon's house as a guest, but Simon had not treated him with half or even a fraction of the respect and deference that Mary had shown him. Mary had washed his feet like a servant. Simon had not served Jesus or showed his appreciation for what Jesus had done for him. Jesus had healed him of his leprosy. He had done so much for Simon, but Simon had shown only aloofness and coldness as Jesus came in. Now Jesus totally transforms the situation. He turns it on his head. Simon had criticized Mary and Jesus for inappropriateness. But Jesus shows him instead that Mary was the honorable one. Simon was the dishonorable host. I don't know how long it took for Simon to realize what Jesus was saying. But Jesus was actually showing Simon his great sin. He was saying Mary is a sinner, yes, but she is a forgiven sinner. But you are even a greater sinner, and you don't even know the seriousness of your debt. You don't even know the extraordinary grace that God has shown towards you. God has forgiven your exceedingly large debt even before you knew it and accepted it. So Mary has already accepted forgiveness and is responding to my grace with love in return. Do you not see the heinousness of your sin? Now we cannot underestimate the importance of this encounter between Jesus and Simon for our lives. Jesus is making it very clear to us that our lives need to be built on and grounded in God's grace. We need to see ourselves as sinners. Only an understanding of God's grace towards us personally can change our hearts and produce the fragrant righteousness of love that fulfills the law of love. Only the grace of Jesus can soften and humble the human heart and lay human pride and accomplishment in the dust. You see, we are nothing in ourselves. We are spiritually bankrupt. We are deserving of death slavery and ultimate death. But Jesus, precious Jesus, has poured out his extravagant love upon us and freed us. He scandalized the world by going to the cross, exposed and naked on a tree. He endured the spitting, the strikes, the lashes, the taunts, and the jeers of the crowd. He endured the leering eyes. He endured the mocking. He took upon himself our dirtiness, our muck, our guilt. He did this for you and for me. He risked his eternal destiny for us. He stooped to the lowest position possible, giving us the possibility of celebrating for eternity, all to fulfill our spiritually bankrupt heart with lavish, undeserving love. He wants to make a sinner out of us Pharisees, a forgiven sinner, he wants us to come to the foot of the cross and remain there, kneeling. The more we walk with Jesus, the more we will see our need to be kneeling at the foot of the cross. We cannot do anything for Christ unless we are conscious of the fact that we are sinners who are not worthy even to tie the master's sandals. The Pharisee remains dead in us only if we maintain our position of humility before the cross of Jesus. We can help no one from sin if we are looking down at them like the Pharisees. The only way we can be of service to the masters is if we are bowed with the humble, contrite love of one who is forgiven. God has one solution to our spiritual bankruptcy. And it's not a form of spiritual capitalism where we earn what we deserve. It is a form of spiritual communism where we get what we don't deserve. Only God's free and undeserving grace can make us spiritually rich and free us to love others lavishly, obeying the commandments of God. 
The only preparation for the kingdom of God that will make us ready is to take our rightful place at the feet of Jesus, all bent over in service, with the weight of God's amazing grace upon our shoulders, ready to do whatever he asks us. There can be no absolute truth in the world, anywhere, where people are not kneeling before Jesus. All else is tainted by hypocrisy, Phariseeism. Thank God for his amazing love that takes a wretch like me and redeems me from my hypocrisy. Amen. Let us receive the Lord's precious blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.